He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dhinu Bandhu Jagapate Kopisha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namos Tute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Rade Vindapani Shuri Vishavana Sute Devi Pranamani Pariyakira Shubham Karoti Kayana Maragam Dana Samaram Sati Bodhi Vinasana Dhinu Jagapate Kopisha Gopyoti Tanarjanam Deepa Jyotira Parasham Deepa Maitaram Deepa Yogya Parasharam Divyad Vandaranya Kapa Drumada, Sri Madhatna Gada Sima Sanisto, Sri Sri Radha Srila Govinda Deva Prestilabhi, Seva Manush Marami, Namo Brahmanya Devaya, Go Brahmanya Taya Chajagadi Taya Krishnaya Govindaya Namo Namaha, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Go Bhakta Vindam, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pasaya Bhutare, Sri Madhi Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamani, Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pacharini, Nirvishesa Sanivari Paskata Desadani, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadha Shiva Sari Gaur Bhakta Vindam, Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare. Welcome to Motivational Monday, which aside from being a special day in and of itself, is the day of the appearance day of Srimati Radharani. Srimati Radharani appeared 15 days after Krishna, just as Balaram appeared seven days before Krishna, and therefore his elder brother Radharani appeared 15 days after the appearance of Krishna. We had Janmashtami exactly 15 days ago, so this is the um, day when Vaishnava devotees of the Lord, aspiring devotees of Krishna, worship their conduit worship their channel to Krishna. Otherwise, it's impossible to approach Krishna directly. One can only do it through the agency of Srimati Radharani. Rob, good morning. Are you there? All right. I am, Prabhu. All right. Have you given any thoughts or done any research on Srimati Radharani in preparation for this day that you can share with us? I have not, unfortunately. Okay. I'm uh, actually a little under the weather this morning, so I'm uh, trying to recuperate and get myself together. It's not COVID, is it? No, no, definitely not. This is uh, dehydration and uh, migraine. Oh, wow. Sorry for that. Well, hopefully the glories of Sri Radharani will soothe some of the pain that you're feeling in your head. Um, I hope so too. According to our greatest authority, Rupa Goswami, it is said that Radharani is Madan Mohan Mahini. Krishna is Madan Mohan. And that means he's so attractive. The beauty of Krishna is so super excellent that he attracts millions and millions of cupids. Kandarpa Koti Kamani Abhishe Sasobam. The beauty of millions and millions of cupids by which boys are attracted to girls and Girls are attracted to boys all over the world in all species <laughs> since the beginning of time. Just imagine how powerful Cupid is. He shoots his arrow and once one's smitten by Cupid's powerful arrows, <clears throat> then one sees a certain individual amongst all the many, many individuals and all their attractive qualities. Having been smitten by the arrow of Cupid, one sees one's partner as the best of all which is the platform under which there's marriages and children and propagation of the species. So imagine what power is invested in Cupid. Palam me pasya maya sri maya jeno yakarodi padakantam bhubi jambanam kevanam in the third canto of the Bhagavatam. Kapil talks about the power of the Supreme Personality of God. It is such that in his form as woman, he defeats even big, world conquerors like Caesar, Charlemagne, and Napoleon. Those world conquerors who have mustered armies and shot thousands and thousands and thousands of arrows to subdue thousands and thousands and thousands of opponents who have annexed whole countries, whole continents, in fact, to their kingdoms. They themselves are defeated by one glance from a woman. So Krishna says, just consider the power of my maya in the form of a woman. The woman's eyebrows go in a curve, and then there's a straight part between, but it resembles a bow, 
And then the glances, the attractive glances that the woman casts to her prospective partner, male that she wants to attract or allure, those are her arrows. And so though the world conquerors have shot millions and millions and millions of arrows and defeated, subdued many, many hundreds of thousands of opponents, they themselves are felled, they themselves are laid low by one single arrow from the glance of a woman. So such is the power of Kutva, and yet it says, Kandarpa Koti Kamani Abhishesha Sarvam. The power of Radharani is such that the power of Krishna is such that he defeats millions of Cupids, and then the power of Radharani defeats Krishna, who himself is the defeater of millions and millions of Cupids. So Radharani himself, herself is the most attractive living entity within all of the creation of Krishna. Krishna himself cannot get enough of Radharani. The whole world is attracted by Krishna, but Krishna himself cannot get enough of Radharani. As devotees, aspiring devotees, we want to be engaged, we want to be caught up in the service of Krishna, we want to be attached as an atom at the lotus feet of Krishna. And in order to do that, we have to put ourselves under the care of Radharani in order to achieve perfection in devotional service. Devotional service, as we've said so many times before, is not an activity of the material world. Devotional service is not only not an activity of the material world, but it is that transcendental activity under the shelter of Radharani, whereby Krishna calls the material world to cease and desist. Govinda Dave, who was on the call with me, knows a lot about cease and desist orders, being a lawyer. And so it is Krishna who orders material nature to cease and desist for someone who's serving Radharani. Krishna wants no impediments in the path of someone who aspires to follow Radharani. Radharani represents the service of Radharani. When you step over into the service of Radharani, then you're stepping out of the material condition life, life of birth, death, disease, and old age, and you're stepping right into the internal potency of Krishna, which is uh, full of life, full of knowledge, never ending. Uh, in the 20th, 14th chapter, verse 20 of the Srimad Bhagavatam, 11th canto, um, Krishna himself says to Uddhava, his very dear and intimate confidential friend, my dear Uddhava, you may know it from me that the attraction I feel for devotional service rendered by my devotees is not to be attained even by the performance of mystic yoga, philosophical speculation, ritualistic sacrifices, the study of Vedanta, practice of severe austerities, or the giving of everything in charity. These are, of course, very nice activities, but Krishna says they're not as attractive to me as the transcendental loving service rendered my devotees. Bhagavad Gita says, Vedishu, Yagishu, Tapasu, Chaiva, Danushi, Adpanya, Param, Param, Ajayati, Tatsavam, Idibam, Yogi, Param, Shtanam, Upayati, Adyam. There is nothing, someone who's engaged in devotional service does not lose any of the benefits, Vedishu, Yagishu, of having studied all the Vedas, Yagishu, having performed every sacrifice there is in Tapasu done every austerity, danashu, given millions and millions of charity, yet vedashu, yagashu, tapashu, danashu, yagashu, tapasu, chaiva, that one who performs devotional service under the direction of Radharani is not bereft of any of the results of studying the Vedas, performing sacrifices, doing austerities, etc., etc., etc. Devotional service is glorified to the extent that Narada Muni tells Yudhisthira, Though yogis may try to reach to their um, mystic cities, the lotus feet of the Lord, though mental speculations may travel at the speed of the mind in order to try to understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna comes himself. He's always receding. He's always elusive. He's always beyond the reach of the, the mind. He's always beyond 
the ability of yoga powers to capture him, but he himself comes to where there are devotees. Naham tishnandi vaikunte yoga namirashu tata gaudri madbhakta tata tishnami narada. Krishna says, I am not to be found in the kingdom of God. I'm not in the hearts of the yogis. Where am I? I am. I come and I sit where devotees are chanting my glories. And I do any service that I can do in order to facilitate or to allow those devotees to chant my glories undisturbedly. We are called first and foremost to honor the Lord uh, with our mind, with our thoughts, with our word, with our wealth, and with our deeds. That is the number one priority for which we find ourselves in this material body, in this current lifetime. If we address ourselves to the prime purpose for which we are created, if we uh, address ourselves to the major thing, Krishna assures us that all the minor things are going to be taken care of. He will come and he will sit personally in the presence of those who are serving him and glorifying him by chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And those who are engaged thusly will never want for shelter, for food, for all the various necessities of life. My Bobby and I were in Los Angeles for many years. And we had a very comfortable situation there as life membership director. We lived in the life membership house. Our food, our transport, our habitation was all taken care of by the temple. Most people consider that we did a good job. And yet we, we, were, we had an urge from within. We were disturbed by the desire to stretch our faith and do more and put it on the line for Krishna. So we came to Utah. We had no money. We were criticized by certain elements of devotional service for leaving our service in Los Angeles. But we wanted to strike out, break ground, do something new, pioneer into a new area for Krishna, and just look at how Krishna has showered his blessings upon us. We just wanted to preach. We just wanted to spread the glories of the Lord. We had no money. We had no resources originally. And yet just on the strength of preaching in the desert area of Utah, and I'm only speaking in terms of the physical description of it, not figuratively, um, Krishna now has given us two temples built from the ground up, all paid for. The original radio station has been broadcasting for 35 years. New technology allows it to be heard all over the world, wherever there's Wi-Fi. Um, altogether, it's uh, four, five, 15, 16, 17, 20 acres of land. Who knows, hundreds, tens of thousands of square feet of building, beautiful festivals, beautiful relationships with the local people. It's all because we prior prioritize. Think of the Pandavas and how Krishna facilitated their devotional service, took care of the little things. Krishna acted as a menial servant to the Pandavas simply because they were following the example of Srimati Radharani and engaging in transcendental service. Narada Muni reminds or addresses Maharaj Yudhisthir in awe and reverence. Saratya parashada sevana sokadota. Sevana means service. But we serve the Lord. We serve Radharani. But because Krishna is attracted to Radharani, he serves the devotees. Look at the various roles that he performed on behalf of the Pandavas. He uh, acted as their friend. He appeared as their uh, cousin brother. He took messages between them back and forth you know, to um, Duryodhan. He pleaded for peace on behalf of the Pandavas at great personal risk and jeopardy. He even took the menial role of a chariot driver during the Battle of Kurukshetra, a chauffeur, if you will. <laughs> There wasn't room in the heat of battle for niceties, for sweet words and hosannas and hallelujahs and prostrations and obeisances. In the heat of the battle, Krishna, Arjuna had to bark out. He had to snap out orders to Krishna on the spur of the moment. Turn left, turn right, slow down, half speed, three-quarter speed, 45-degree turn to the right, full stop. 
Krishna enjoyed, he relished those words from his devotee who was engaged in his service. Krishna says that he likes the chastising words of Radharani more than the reverent hymns of the Vedas. He says that love which comes from total surrender, total familiarity, if you will, is more relishable to him than love, as he describes it, weakened by awe and reverence. He would rather hear the harsh, chastising words of Radharani than the reverent hymns of the Vedas. <laughs> Jayadev Goswami, in his Gita Govinda, shares these conversational words, wherein one gopi tells her friend, Krishna is the reservoir of pleasure within this universe. His body is as soft as the lotus flower, and his free behavior with the gopis, the cowherd maidens, which appears exactly the young boy's attraction to a young girl, is the subject matter of transcendental conjugal love. Great liberated transcendentals who have left far behind and long time ago the ruminations, the hankerings after material sensory stimulation. They found their pleasure in the spiritual atmosphere, the internal potency of the Lord. They have given up all aspirations, all longings and hankerings to hear the material narrations of activities in this material world. But they themselves perk up their ears, open their eyes whenever there's some subject matter of Krishna to be discussed. And that means that there's nothing mundane about Krishna's pastimes. Satam prashangam mamirya sambido bhavanti urikana rasho payanaham. In the material world, we love to read stories about heroes and heroines and conspiracies and betrayals and payback. And it enamors us. The, the, the income which is generated by best-selling fictional books on the market is just stunning. It's phenomenal. But if you will turn your attention to the pastimes of Krishna, as they're described in the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Mahabharata, all those hankerings for hearing stories and love affairs and all that, it's completely satisfied and it is transcendental. So whereas the stories of mundaners will keep you revolving in the cycle of birth and death in this material world interminably, when you transfer that attraction, that hankering for hearing stories, to hearing the stories about Krishna, Krishna's devotees, and Krishna's pastimes, then that same propensity brings about purification and liberation. Mahavirya Sampido, Krishna is the most heroic. He's the greatest champion. He's the greatest lover. He's the greatest speaker. He's the greatest wit. He's the most beautiful. He's the ultimate. So there, you don't feel the lack when you turn your attention to hearing about Krishna. You don't feel the lack from hearing about Steven Seagal or Tom Cruise or any of those so-called celebrities of the silver screen. One becomes fully satisfied hearing the topics of Satam Prashangam Amirya Bhavanti Yudhikana Rishayopanahim. When those subject matters are drunk through into the ears, just like you put into the hole of the mouth, nourishing, invigorating, tasty foodstuffs. When you uh, take in through the holes of the ears, Rashayana Kata, and you relish the stories about Krishna, and then they filter themselves down to the heart. The result is an inalterable and irreversible, uh, an overwhelming taste, an attraction, and an attachment for hearing about Krishna. So Jayadev Goswami, he says that, let me just back up a little bit here. He says, Krishna's body is as soft as a lotus flower and his free behavior why is his behavior with the gopis free, whereas his behavior with all other living beings is constrained, to say the least? It's formal. There's a lot of etiquette and profile, protocol, if there's any relationship at all. And yet Krishna is completely free with his intimate, surrendered disciples, devotees, 
the gopis because they are not envious him. Says those who are envious of Krishna, who doubt the supremacy of Krishna, everything that they achieve, everything that they aspire for, ends in defeat. Uh, they're misdirected in terms of the external material energy. Uh, however, when one puts aside envy, jealousy, a sense of competition. You know, why does Krishna get all the attention? Why does everyone talk about Krishna? That's why we left the spiritual world in the first place. So the path to reestablish ourselves, to reinstate ourselves in the eternal spiritual world is to be completely non-envious of Krishna. What can I do for Krishna? How can I render some service to Krishna in the footsteps of Srimati Radharani? And that's why Krishna has free behavior. He's uninhibited when he acts with the gopis. He can do whatever he wants. He can get himself up to jokes and pranks and sarcastic remarks, giving and receiving. He says, Itam satam brahma sukhana bucha dasham gatanam paradevan mayasi termina sakam vijahunum krita punja punja. The question is asked in the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam. Who are these young untutored, unschooled, simple, rustic, rural, cowherd boys. Who are they? They don't seem to have the material accoutrements of high birth, education, not necessarily movie star looks. If you take the example of Madhu Mangala. And yet, yet Krishna's taking them on his shoulders. They have contests, they have wrestling matches, they have transcendental free from envy competitions, and Krishna often arranges to lose the contest. And the results of losing or being bested by his peers is that he will have to take them on his shoulders. And so the question is asked, who are these on the service of it? Simple, uncultured, uneducated, um, Unaristocratic coward boys who are sitting, Sakam Rijarahu who are sitting on the shoulders of Krishna, who are being carried by God. Who are they? Sakam They are great exalted yogis, transcendentalists, who in many, many, many previous births, Kritapun performed mountains and mountains of pious activities in order to get the exalted position of riding on the shoulders of Krishna. In other words, Krishna submits himself to those who render devotional service under the guidance of Sri Mati Radharani. <clears throat> Jiva Goswami goes on here to say, a pure devotee follows in the footsteps of the gopis and worships the gopis as follows, let me offer my respectful obeisances to all the young cowherd girls whose bodily features are so attractive. Simply by their beautiful, attractive features, they are worshiping the Supreme Personality of God and Krishna. And out of all the young gopis, Simata Radhe Radhe, Jayadev Goswami informs us, is the most prominent. Shiva, no less an authority than Shiva, the greatest of all yogis, says to his wife Parvati, she asks him, what is the greatest form of worship? What is the greatest, the supreme param satya activity for the living being? Shiva says, Aradhanam Sarvasham Vishnu Aradhanam Param. Of all types of worship, the worship of Vishnu is supreme. But then he goes on to say, he doesn't leave it there, he says, Tajma Paratarim Devi but better than worship of Krishna or Vishnu is worship of his devotee. Better than worship of Krishna is worship of the gopis. And better than worship of the gopis is worship of Radharani. She is the topmost. Of the gopis, Krishna, the supreme personality of Godhead, says, In the 
29th verse in the fifth chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Krishna says, I am the owner. I am the most I am the creator of worlds and worlds and worlds and worlds with all the wealth and the pearls and the jewels and the minerals and the oils, uh, the ores. That's all coming from me. There is no one more wealthy than God because he's created everything out of his own potencies. <clears throat> and yet that Supreme Personality of Godhead himself, who is the source of all wealth, who is the uh, that uh, singularity from which everything uh, comes, declares himself, he registers, he files Govinda Dev, he goes to Waldo and Jones, he uh, makes an appointment with George Pratt, and he comes in the door and he sits down and he says, I want to file for bankruptcy. And George Pratt says, why would you, who created everything, who are the Lord of Lords, the source from which every, why, why, who, why and who has such control over you that you can never repay them? And Krishna answers, the gopis, they're just simple cowherd maidens in a rural village of Vrindavan, but no one has the level of surrender and love for me that the gopis do. Na paraya hum. Na paraya means there is nothing superior to the love of the gopis headed by Radharani. Na param nirvadya soshabhu bhaya shapi bhubadaya yo mabhajan durjaya shinkadaha. So I declare myself crippled, disabled, on the rocks, at a disadvantage. Govinda Dev has undoubtedly interviewed many people on the subject matter of bankruptcy. And they all come in like, yeah, they got a hold on me. My creditors got a hold on me. I, I'm, out, I'm under a situation that I can't get out of without, uh, without declaring myself bereft, penniless. They're all like expressed. They're all there because of a shortcoming. So the Supreme Personality of God it is Atmaramas Chamunia. It's completely self-sufficient. Um, he's absolutely, absolutely the supreme in wealth, beauty, fame, knowledge, and beauty and renunciation. He sits there in George's office and says, I want to file bankruptcy because I can never, even in the day of Brahma, repay the gopis for their unqualified, unparalleled, super excellent level of surrender unto me. Now, the beauty of Radharam the beauty of this transcendent personality. And by the way, Radha, just like we said, Aradhanam Sarvesham, in that quote from Padma Purana, when Parvati asked Shiva, what's the best sort of Radha? So Shiva said, Aradhanam Sarvesham, of all types of worship. So Radha comes from the word Radha, which means worship, and Rani means queen. Of all the servants of the Lord, the queen, the topmost, is Srimati Radharani. And here's a description again from Jay, Jayadev Goswami of the beauty, the transcendent beauty of Srimati Radharani. Her eyes, the feet, the attractive features of the eyes of the Chakri bird. When one sees the face of Radharani, he immediately hates the beauty of the moon. Her bodily complexion defeats the beauty of gold. Let us all look on the transcendental beauty of Srimati Radharani. Krishna describes his attraction for Radharani by saying that when I create some joking phrases in order to enjoy the beauty of Radharani, Radharani hears these joking words with great attention. But by her bodily features and counter words, she neglects me. And I even possess unlimited pleasure by her neglect of me. For she becomes so beautiful that she increases my pleasure 100 times. So the whole world, either directly or indirectly, is seeking the attention of Krishna. The Pandavas endured so many troubles, betrayals, conspiracy, exile in the forest 13 years, only to return to a situation where they had to kill their teachers and friends and relatives in order to regain their kingdom. And as a result of their forbearance, and their steady, unwavering faith in Krishna, at the end of all of that, Krishna smiled on them. 
They did all of that in order to get one smile of satisfaction of Krishna upon their lives. Kunti declared that our lives are perfect because we comported ourselves during all those challenges and all those reverses in such a way that Krishna was pleased. That's my boy. That's my girl. But that Krishna, who made the lives of the Pandavas perfect after having endured decades and decades of persecution, that Krishna, he begs for a smile from Radharani, that when Radharani ignores him or neglects him, insults him or criticizes him, he's just thinking, it's running through his brain. What can I do to get right with Radharani? What can I do to defuse her anger? What can I do to make a smile come under your face? The whole thrust of Godhead with all of his intellect and all of his power, all of his beauty is geared toward the single pointed goal of getting Radharani to give up her chill, to crack a smile, thaw towards Krishna like that. In the Pajavali of Rupa Goswami, it's stated that when the gopis hear the sound of Krishna's flute, they immediately forget all rebukes offered by the elderly members of their families. Now, one aspect of the gopis surrender is that in the spiritual world, there is the feeling that they have husbands. And so they go to Krishna at great risk. They have to sneak out. They have to do everything in secret, surreptitiously, so as not to incur the suspicion of their elders who want them to act properly according to the dictates of society. So all these feelings and emotions are churning in the spiritual world to make it a just a exciting, a dynamic, never static, never boring cauldron of emotions. Anybody who thinks that spiritual life is devoid of emotions is under a great illusion. Imagine a cauldron of emotions where Radharani is wearing a necklace given to her by Krishna and Radharani's uh, elders are looking at that necklace and, and something about that necklace is familiar. And I think I saw that necklace with Krishna in the past. Could Krishna have given Radharani? Radharani's married. She's unchaste. She's, oh, this is, and Radharani's thinking all this Calculations are going through Radharani's brain and she's turning red and crimson with humiliation, trying to cover, hide her irrepressible attraction for Krishna. All this is going on on a totally spiritual level because it's for Krishna. It's Krishna-centered. It's not about one's own self-gratification. It's not about uh, satisfying the flames of one's lusty desires. It's about giving pleasure to Krishna through scenarios, through uh, uh, conspiracies, through uh, innuendo. Oh, there's so much going on there in the spiritual world. Continuing here, Rupa Goswami, the Lalita Madhava, he says that the movements of Krishna's eyebrows are just like the Yamuna River, and the smiling of Radharani is like the moonshine. When the Yamuna and the moonshine come into contact, on the bank of the river, the water tastes just like nectar, and drinking it gives great satisfaction. It is as cooling as piles of snow. Similarly, in the Pajavali, one constant companion of Radharani says, My dear moon-faced Radharani, your whole body appears very content, and yet there are signs of tears in your eyes. Your speech is faltering, and your chest is heaving. By all these signs, I can understand you must have heard the blowing of Krishna's flute, and it was a result of this. Your heart is now melting. <clears throat> Continuing on, Srimati Radharani, <clears throat> again in Pajavali says, Mr. Cupid, please do not excite me by throwing your arrows at my body. Mr. Air, please do not arouse me with the fragrance of flowers. I am now bereft of Krishna's loving attitude, and so under the circumstances, what is the use of my sustaining this useless body? There is no need for such a body by any living entity. This is a sign of frustration in ecstatic love for Krishna. Our great text, compiled by Rupa Goswami, the Bhakti Rasa and Rita the ocean of nectar devotion, is all about emotions. It unlocks the vast 
horizons of the inner world of spirit. I was talking last night during the Sunday feast about how wonderful our external world is. There's the sunrise in the east and the sunset in the south, and there's mountains, there's rivers, there's beaches, there's oceans, there's there's plains of growing grains. There's this body with all of its checks and balances, and timing systems and counterbalances. This body is wonderful. This external world of ours is wonderful. But Krishna says, Parastas Matabhavo Anya. There's another world aside from the external material world. Another world aside from the wonderful and intricate functioning and workings of this body. Can you imagine this body as a uh, uh, a manufactured item that lives and regenerates and heals itself for 70 to 80 to 90 years. There's nothing like this body. There's nothing like this mind. ID, computer uh, development, they aren't yet even close. They're not even within a thousand miles of duplicating the facility and the dexterity of the mind. Mind is just mind-boggling. And yet all of this is as nothing, a, a thousand, a billionth part of a drop, of a billionth part of a drop in the ocean of the nectar devotion. The real world, the stunning, the expansive, the inimitable world is the world within. We miss that with our gadgets and our trinkets and our pettiness and our enviousness and our competitive spirit and our appetites and being distracted by our lusty desires and our ego and itself. We bury the light of our inner world. We bury the light of our spirit in the basement of trivialities and inadequate inanities and things of no consequence whatsoever in the long run. So Krishna brings life to light through the words of the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna puts the spotlight on the inner spirit which is a vast world. In the nectar devotion, the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu is an ocean, and each chapter describes different emotions which wax and wane, ebb and flow, like the waves of the Pacific Ocean in the spiritual world. And so these passages hopefully are giving us a little taste of that far superior world where life is a thrill at every moment where one goes through one's whole existence of eternity with goosebumps, you see, with hair standing on end. <laughs> Govinda Day makes a comment here. He says, I am constitutionally incapable of uttering a coherent sentence in the presence of my spiritual master is Radha Swami. So filing bankruptcy on behalf of Lord Krishna would be out of the question. <laughs> Thanks for that. So let's just go back here and continue to swim this morning in the ocean of ecstatic emotions which have to do with the reciprocal loving relationship exchange of words between Krishna and his topmost goat devotees, the gopis, headed up by Srimati Radharani. There's a statement by Srimati Radharani in the Dana Keli Kamudi where she points to Krishna and she says, this clever boy of the forest has the beauty of a bluish lotus flower, and he can attract all the young girls of the universe. Now, after giving me a taste of his transcendental body, he has enthused me, and it is more than I can tolerate. I am now feeling like a female element, elephant who has been enthused by a male elephant. Can you imagine the wave of that emotion, that in the material world, we call it a lusty desire. But when it's for Krishna, it's never a lusty, self-centered desire. Srimati Radharani's emotions arise and torture her and agitate her to the end of giving pleasure to Krishna. In that mood of Madhurya Rasa, the highest mood, conjugal love, one's Love for Krishna proceeds through five rasas or five stages as described in the nectar devotion. There is santa, which is neutrality, the grass, the clouds, 
the water of the spiritual world play a passive role. They provide water for Krishna to drink, shade for him from the sun, a soft blanket for him to walk on with bare feet. Then there are dasya, getting a little bit more elevated. Sometimes it's compared to sugar water, which is heated and thickened through various stages, through molasses, and then finally to rock-hard candy, which is the ultimate conjugal rasa, maduya rasa of the gopis. And so the thickening of the relationship goes on in the next stage is dasya, where one takes a role, a shurup, a body, in the spiritual world of one who's younger than Krishna or serving Krishna in some capacity. Krishna is viewed in awe and reverence, like an older brother or a senior. And so these are servants who go around trying to make various tasteful arrangements for Krishna's enjoyment. And then there's Sakya. These are the playmates of Krishna, approximately the same age as Krishna. They're the ones that are seen sometimes on the shoulders of Krishna, having given up envy and competitiveness, and providing pleasure for Krishna by competing with him in wrestling matches and various sporting events. And then there's Vatsalya, such as Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj, and they assume a parental relationship with Krishna where um, they're bathing him, feeding him, uh, putting him to bed at night, trying to um, uh, serve him in a superior role, like thinking that Krishna depends upon them for his cleanliness, for his nutrition, for his stability, for his domestic situation. And then finally, there is Srimati Radharani. So the steady ecstasy, the, the waves of emotion which arise in the hearts of such as Radharani are the original cause of their bodily enjoyment. He says, Radharani again tells one of her constant female companions, my dear friend, who is this boy whose eyelids dancing constantly have increased the beauty of his face and attracted my desire for conjugal love. His ears are decorated with buds of Ashoka flowers, and he has dressed himself in yellow robes. By the sound of his flute, this boy makes me impatient. Now this relationship between Krishna and his devotees can never be disturbed or interrupted by any material or personal consideration. It is the emblem of pure, unselfish love. There is a statement in the Nectar Devotion that says, if something makes Krishna unhappy, even if that normally would make Radharani happy, that becomes her greatest unhappiness. And if Krishna, something makes Krishna happy, even though that would be evocative of unhappiness from Radharani, then Krishna, that, would, that becomes her greatest happiness. So this is completely selfless love, which is never disturbed by any personal considerations. The undisturbed nature of this conjugal love between Radha and Krishna is described in this quote. Just a little distance away from Krishna, it's described was Mother Yashoda. Krishna was over there, surrounded by all of his friends. In front of Krishna's eyes was Chandavali, and at the same time, on a chunk of stone in the front of the entrance to Raja stood a demon known as Brishasura. Uh, uh, so all these things are going on. There's Mother Yashoda. There's Krishna and all of his coward boyfriends. There's Chandravali. There's a demon threatening called Brishasura. But even with all that's going on and all the circumstances and all the things that are competing and demanding for Krishna's attention, his mother wants him to do something. His coward boys... Uh, boyfriends are demanding something. The demon is threatening. And yet it says, even with all that going on, when Krishna, looking over the whole scene, saw Radharani standing at a distance, almost invisible, behind a bush of many creepers, immediately it says his beautiful eyebrows move just like whoosh, lightning towards her. Here's another similar instance from the Nectar Devotion. On one side of the courtyard, the dead body of Shankashura, the conch shell demon, was lying, surrounded by many jackals. On another side, many learned Brahmins, who were all self-control, were chanting Vedic mantras. They were offering prayers, which were as soothing, it's described as a cool breeze in the summer. 
in front of Krishna. So this is going on the right, this is going on the left. In front of Krishna, Lord Balaram, his other brother, is standing, also causing a cooling effect. But even amidst all these different circumstances of soothing and disturbing and even repugnant, you know, the rotting dead body of Sankachari and disturbing effects, the lotus flower of ecstatic conjugal love that Krishna felt for Radharani could not wither in the leaders. This love of Krishna for Radharani is often compared to a blooming lotus. The only difference is that Krishna's love remains ever increasingly beautiful. Finally, Rupa Goswami divides conjugal love into two portions, Vipralamba, which is love and separation, and some voga or conjugal love in direct contact. Direct contact. It says, when the lover and the beloved have a distinct feeling of not meeting each other, that's called purvi raga, or preliminary attraction. In the Pajavali, Radharani tells her companion, my dear friend, I was just going to the bank of the moon, and all of a sudden, a very nice boy, his complexion like a dark blue cloud, became visible in front of my eyes. He glanced over me in a way that I cannot describe. Since this has occurred, I can no longer engage my mind in the duties of my household affairs. This is attraction for Krishna. And on the other hand, Krishna himself says, he says, just like uh, it says in connection, with the gopis, he says, I cannot sleep at night and my mind is always fixed on Radharani. This is the preliminary reciprocal attraction that Krishna feels between himself and his devotees. And one or two uh, final quotes here. It says, when Srimati Radharani saw Krishna enjoying himself in the company of several other devotees, she became a little jealous because her special prestige was being dimmed. Therefore, she immediately left the scene and took shelter in a nice flower bush where the black drones were humming. Then hiding herself behind the creepers, creepers, she began to express her sorrow to one of her consorts. So it's interesting that in Srimad Bhagavatam, Radharani's name is never mentioned, but there's one gopi, it is indicated, to whom Krishna's mind flows above and beyond all others. And even when Krishna was enjoying the company of all the gopis in the rasa dance, when Radharani separated, when she left the company of the Gopis and took shelter in a distant place, Krishna no longer took pleasure in the rest of the Gopis. Krishna left the Gopis. He abandoned them in order to search after Sri Madhirani. So when Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, leaves the company of so many devotees in order to search out Sri Madhirani, how can we, as aspiring servants of Krishna, not take this day, Radhashtami, auspicious day, the appearance day of Radharani, 15 days after Krishna, on our heads and treat every moment, every minute, and every second of this day with great reverence. This, even above Janmashtami, is the most special day of the year. We can go before Srimadhi Radharani and make this prayer. Srimadhi Radharani, please be pleased upon me. Please give me some service. Find something to do in the servants of the servants of the servant of the servant. Other than Srimati Radhe, there is no access to Krishna. The way to Krishna is through Srimati Radharani. Krishna himself declares that one who claims to be my devotee directly is not my devotee, but only one who's, who approaches me through the devotee of the devotee of the devotee of the devotee of Radharani is actually my devotee. Elsewhere in the ninth canto, Krishna says, Aham bhakta parir hyasratanda sadabhugrashitra bhaktir bhaktir guni. Devotional service is so powerful that I have no control. I lose my independence in the face of Radharani. She controls my every move. She dominates my mood. She subjugates me in every single way by her unparalleled, unselfish level of supreme Krishna consciousness in the mood of conjugal love. So those are some thoughts to start off this auspicious day of Radhastami. And we're going to conclude by reading the English translation to a series of prayers 
on Rada. On Rada. These were forwarded on our WhatsApp uh, app this morning by Govinda Dave from the Salt Lake City Temple. This is a translation by Kusa Kratadas from a work called the Urd Vamanya Tantra. And these are spoken, these are words, prayers spoken by Lord Shiva himself to Parvati. And I won't read all the Sanskrit because there's quite a few verses. I may not even finish all the verses, but let's just dive into it by way of concluding our glorification of Srimati Radharani this morning. First verse, O Goddess, says Lord Shiva, worship by the King of Sages, O Goddess, who removes the sufferings of the three worlds, O Goddess, whose face is a blossoming lotus, O Goddess, who enjoys pastimes in the forest, O daughter of Vishubhanu, O companion of Braja's prince, when will you cast your merciful glance upon me? O goddess, staying in a vine cottage by an Ashoka tree, O goddess, whose delicate feet are as splendid as red blossoms, O goddess, whose hand grants fearlessness, O abode of transcendental opulences, when will you cast your merciful sidelong glance upon me? O goddess, who playfully shooting the arrows of your glances from the curved bows of your auspicious amorous eyebrows, have completely subdued Nanda's son, Krishna, when will you cast your merciful glance upon me? O goddess whose form is as splendid as Champaka flowers, gold and lightning, O goddess whose face eclipses millions of autumnal moons, O goddess whose eyes are wonderful, restless, lung, chakura birds, when will you cast your merciful glance upon me. O young girl intoxicated with passion, O goddess decorated with cheerful, jealous anger, O goddess who passionately loves your beloved Krishna, O goddess learned in the playful arts, O goddess expert at enjoying amorous pastimes in the kingdom of the peerlessly opulent forest groves of Vrindavan, when will you cast your merciful sidelong glance upon me? O goddess, decorated with a pearl necklace of bold, amorous hints. O goddess, as fair as gold. O goddess, whose breasts are great golden water pots. O ocean of happiness filled with the scented powders of gentle smiles. When will you cast your merciful glance upon me? O goddess, whose arms are lotus stalks dancing on the waves. O goddess, whose dark eyes are dancing vines. O oh, playful, beautiful, charming goddess, when will you cast your merciful, sidelong glance upon me? O oh, goddess who wear a golden necklace on the three-lined conch shell of your neck, O oh, goddess splendid with three jasmine garlands and three jeweled necklaces, O oh, goddess whose moving locks of hair are decorated with bunches of flowers, when will you cast your merciful, sidelong glance on me? O oh, goddess who wears a sash of flowers on your curved hips, O oh, goddess charming with a sash of sinkling jeweled, tinkling jeweled bells. O oh, goddess whose beautiful thighs punish the regal elephant's trunk. When will you cast your merciful sidelong glance upon me? O oh, goddess whose ankles tinkling is more beautiful than the sounds of many mantras and the cooing of many regal swans. O oh, goddess whose graceful motions mock the moving golden vines. When will you cast your merciful sidelong glance on me. O goddess, worshipped by Brahma, O goddess, to whom countless millions of Vaishnavas bow down. O goddess, who gives blessings to Parvati, Sachi, and Saraswati. O goddess, whose toenails are anointed with limitless opulences and mystic perfections. When will you cast your merciful glance upon me? O queen of Vedic sacrifices, O queen of pious activities, queen of the material world, queen of the demigods, queen of Vedic scholarship, queen of knowledge, queen of the goddess of fortune, queen of patience, queen of Vrindavan, the forest of happiness, O queen of Raja, o empress of Raja, O Shimati Radhika, obeisances unto you. After hearing this most astonishing prayer of mine, being recited by a devotee, may Sri Vishubhanu Nandini constantly make him the object of her most merciful sidelong glance. At that time, all of his karmic reactions 
whether mature, fructified, or lying in seed, will be completely destroyed. Then he will again gain entrance into the assembly of Nanda Nandana's eternal loving associates. If a sadhaka with purified intelligence recites these verses with a fixed mind, on the lunar day known as the full moon day, the bright ashtami, the dashami, the ekadasi, and the trayarashati, then each and every one of his desires will be fulfilled one by one, and by the merciful sidelong glance of Sri Radha, he will obtain devotional service that has a special symptom of being imbued with pure, ecstatic love of God. That sadhak who recites these verses a hundred times while standing in the waters of Sri Radha Kund up to his thighs, navel, chest, or neck will attain complete perfection in the five goals of human existence, dharma, artha, karma, moksha, and prema. He will also attain the power by which everything he says will come true. He becomes very powerful and often due to attaining the transcendental majesty, and he gets to meet Sri Radhika face to face, seeing her even with his present eyes. By the chanting of this prayer in Radha Kund, Sri Radhika becomes so pleased that she instantly bestows a great benediction on the devotee, which is that he sees her beloved Shaima Sundar with his very, very own eyes. Thus ends the Radhika Kaya Krupa Kataksha Srotam found in the Urjva Manaya Tantra. Last, it says, the aspirant who recites this hymn on the full dune day, on the eighth day of the waxing moon, achieves Radhika's mercy and attains to unqualified, unselfish, unparalleled love of God. Finally, it is said this is the most famous stotra in Vrindavan. It is sometimes called the national anthem of Vrindavan. All the devotees and the matajis know it by heart, and it is recited daily in most temples and nearby villages. Indeed, this pre-going prayer is regarded as the very heart of Vrindavan. It's known as the king of prayers, which petitions the most merciful sidelong glance from Shimati Radharani. Shri Shri Radha Govinda Ki Jai Sriman Rasa Rasa Rambi Vamsa Vira Karsan Vinaya Shri Gopi Nata Striya Shri Raha Divyad Vrindarana Kaupadrumada Sriman Ratna Karashim Shri Shri Radha Shrola Govinda De Preste Labi Sevimana Shmanami Let us offer our humble prostrated obeisances to the topmost devotee of Krishna Srimati Radha and pray that we've been engaged some or other in the service of the service of the service of your servants of your servants of your servants. Om Tat Sat Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare. Just an announcement if you're local, the celebration of Radhasami begins at our Salt Lake City Temple this evening at six o'clock and goes till eight o'clock and devotees will break their fast for the wonderful feast offered to Srimati Radharani. And generally speaking, it's broadcast live on Facebook from the Facebook page, Hare Krishna Temple of Salt Lake City. So if you're at a distance and you can't attend, you can at least drop in on the holy uh, festivities this very evening. Thanks for being with us. My Bobby, Jean, Richard, Vadanath, Boyden, and Sunil, Dani, Govindadev, Ram, Kishore, Rakesh, Raghava, Brent. Thank you, one and all starting off this auspicious day with me and I with you. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram. Ram.